But first, and this seems a miracle, there are now signs that the heroic Ukrainians could, could actually beat that massive Russian army. The Russians thought their invasion of Ukraine would be all over in a few days. Well, this is now day 12, no sign of victory at all. And yes, a lot more Ukrainians are still going to die fighting for their freedom. But let me show you some of the signs of this possible miracle, the most unlikely victory. The Ukrainians are using shoulder-fired missiles and some jets to knock out whole convoys of Russian armour, and especially trucks carrying crucial supplies, like this convoy of more than 30 trucks and armoured vehicles that were ambushed near the besieged city of Kharkiv in the east of Ukraine. And this is not unusual. Ukrainian soldiers have also destroyed these tanks near Kiev, for instance. The Ukrainian Defence Ministry claims that last Saturday alone it also shot down nine Russian aircraft, nine in one day, including five planes like this one over Kharkiv and four helicopters like this one, again brought down by a shoulder-fired missile. The footage is from the Ukrainian army and I have not verified it. For the Russians to lose nine aircraft in one day is extraordinary, more than 100 all up so far. And helps to explain why Russia's air force is reluctant to fly over Ukraine and give its land forces air cover. But perhaps the best evidence of Russia's failure so far is this 60 kilometer long Russian convoy to the north of the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, which has barely moved now for days. Just why is not clear. But there are persuasive reports of Russian forces running out of fuel and food, of driving vehicles that simply haven't been maintained of getting stuck in the Ukrainian mud, or just having incompetent senior officers who do not know how to plan a massive invasion. And actually, this failure is putting immense pressure on Russian President Vladimir Putin, and I think it's showing. It was Putin's idea to invade Ukraine, and it was his fantasy that Ukrainians would, you know, welcome the Russian invaders as liberators. And the whole thing's a classic failure of a dictator, like, just like Hitler when he decided to invade Russia. Putin doesn't like people telling him he's wrong, and his people get too scared to tell him. In fact, Putin now looks too scared of his top defence people in turn, to, too scared to let them sit anywhere near him. Our chief spy catcher, by the way, has noticed. Paul Simon, Director General of Australia's Secret Intelligence Service, says this emerging trend of personal miscalculation, combined with the loneliness of supreme leadership that Putin seems to prefer, does not augur well for his future. Joining me is Ukrainian MP Helena Yanchenko. Thank you so much for joining me. This is, uh, uh, my heart goes out to you and, and, and everyone in, in Ukraine. This attack on the hospital, were the Russian bombers there just clumsy, you know, a, an accident of war, or do you suspect something worse? Uh, no. Uh, well, hello, everyone. My name is Helena Gyanchenko. I'm a member of Parliament of Ukraine and mother of two children. And my uh, country is going through a nightmare for two weeks already. Uh, we see that Russians uh, wanted to invade the whole country and overtake it in just a couple of days, and they didn't manage it. They failed it. And now Putin being mad on the situation, he starts just killing innocent people. What is happening now in eastern uh, cities of Ukraine, like Mariupol, Berdyansk, and some other, is a horror. They uh, hit on purpose kindergartens, hospitals, uh, residential neighborhood in huge amount. Yesterday, the mayor of Mariupol have uh, reported that over 1,300 uh, innocent civilians only in uh, Mariupol were murdered by Russian occupants. Uh, near Kyiv, in, uh, in the uh, towns and cities near Kyiv, Russian occupants uh, are running into residential houses, dragging people uh, uh, to the street and shoot them. These are massive executions and crimes against humanity. They see that they can't invade the country and, and people keep fighting and they just start turning Ukraine into a massive graveyard to, to, to frighten us, to frighten the people. So like 
I, I don't know what is their point, but actually Europe didn't see these kind of crimes since World War II. And I believe that war, World War II was not as horrible as that because uh, Russians, they're just killing massively, massive executions of civilians, pregnant people, families with children on their arms. This is the horror that our country is uh, going through for the last uh, two, two months. It's International Women's Day, and I want to mark it by talking to a strong woman, the great Australian. Gina Reinhardt is Australia's richest person. Some snarky journalists have sniped, well, that couldn't have been too hard because Reinhardt inherited a company from her father, Lang Hancock, the legendary mine, almost the father of West Australia's iron ore industry. But that is selling Gina Reinhardt way, way short. When she inherited Hancock Prospecting, it was a mess up to its neck in debt. Reinhardt turned it around and herself proposed, developed and now runs the giant Roy Hill mine in the Pilbara, as, as well as extensive agricultural businesses. Hancock Prospecting is now so important to this country that last year alone it paid $2.7 billion in taxes for schools and hospitals and so on. Normally Gina Reinhardt doesn't give interviews. She doesn't trust journalists. She's right. But we've been friends for years and she wouldn't even come on my show. But today she will. Because the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, the rise of China, all of these make her think, as I do, that Australia really must wake up. I think what we're also learning is, uh, and, and boy, did Europe learn this, right? They, they, they had all these weird green policies. So, you know, like Germany got rid of uh, nuclear power, they got rid of a lot of coal-fired power. Uh, countries like uh, Britain cracked down on fracking and all this kind of... And they made themselves so dependent on Russian gas that at first they weren't going to challenge Putin in any way, uh, seriously, to stop this invasion of Ukraine. We are now learning we can't afford to be so in hock with dictatorships like China, and we've got to trade more with democracies like, you know, India, so that the free world is stronger and less dependent on dangerous countries. Now, you've promoted trade with India for years, but I don't know, the way the left here, for instance, campaigned furiously to kill the Adani coal mine, which is coal for India, I, I just couldn't believe that. Well, of course, trade with uh, China, that's fine. You've covered quite a few topics there, um, Andrew. Um, but, um, you know, I think one of the things that we need to think about as a country is economic sanctions. Um, now, you can't have economic sanctions if you're uh, of any merit and of any usefulness if you are prevented as a country from getting the supplies you might need from uh, countries that are no longer friendly with you and creating war. Um, and a, a huge example of this was given with um, Biden recently. He's done a lot of green stuff uh, to his country. Petrol prices, or sorry, fuel prices um, at the petrol pump are already rising in his country. And ditto um, energy costs, power costs, electricity costs. Uh, so what happened when he started his um, somewhat feeble um, uh, sanctions is the main one he should have been targeting against Russia is, of course, um, uh, fuel. And he didn't because of the rising costs of the petrol pump through these green policies, the rising costs of electricity. But, you know, we have to be in a position where we can make economic sanctions work. We've really and truly learned from that. Um, good call in relation to Adani. Um, doing, um, uh, they've struggled so hard in Australia with all sorts of restrictions against them. And to trending now, well, trending now is outrage about Prince William's visit to a Ukrainian centre to show his solidarity with Ukraine. And what has outraged Twitter and some of the media is that Prince William said that the war in Ukraine was very alien to see, given he said that British people are, and I quote, more used to seeing conflict in Africa and Asia. Joining me is Daisy Cousins, a YouTube star with her own video channel. Daisy, Prince William is a racist for saying that. Uh, is he really and why? 
Oh, well, look, you know, of, of course he's, he's not a racist <laughs> for saying that. I mean, you and I know that. But, of course, the Wokies on Twitter won't know that. This is simply an example of the regressive left taking something that someone has said willfully out of context and uh, willfully misinterpreting it. You know, William, Prince William was talking, of course, about the contemporary world, the state of the world now, and that the state of the world now is that, yes, it is alien to see war occurring in Europe. We are more used to seeing it happen in places like Africa or Asia or, say, the Middle East. However, the Wokey Brigade on Twitter, who sort of hate him on principle, took that to mean that Prince William was saying, oh, well, Europeans would never go to war. It's only Africans and Asians who would do things like that. But no, oh, not the Europeans. Sad. And they kept saying, well, doesn't he remember World War One and World War Two and the Bosnian War? And my goodness, it makes him a terrible, evil, racist, colonial oppressor yada 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 I mean first of all with the examples they've used of war in Europe well the most recent of those is the Bosnian War and that happened three decades ago Andrew believe it or not the 90s was actually three decades ago so that is rather disingenuous and the interesting thing is Andrew that the work crowd on Twitter has used this you know kind of clumsy phrasing by Prince William to accuse him of being the evil racist royal who allegedly expressed concerns <laughs> to Prince Harry about how dark baby Archie's skin would be. It must have been Prince William because he's a racist colonizer. But look, Andrew, as you and I have discussed before, the thing about those alleged comments is that both Harry and Meghan gave uh, rather inconsistent accounts of when those actually happened. Meghan said to Oprah Winfrey that the comments happened while she was pregnant with Archie, but then Harry came on an hour later and said that the comments happened right at the beginning of the, re of the relationship. So if they want us to expect that anyone said that, they could at least get the time right and I think it's slightly unlikely that Prince William who <laughs> seems to be a, a beacon dare I say it of inclusivity and niceness said hello little brother I'm worried about how dark your son's skin might be let's talk